what we set out to accomplish as Chicago Quantum. So the first is we wanted to run the stock portfolio problem on the quantum annealing computer, the D-Wave 2000. And again, just for people that may not know, it's a 2017 architecture. It's called a Chimera. It's a 16 by 16 by four um, qubit process. So what that means is each cell of eight qubits connects to four other qubits. And so the new version, which is 2020 called Pegasus, will actually have a different architecture and at least two and a half times more connectivity. So in order to do this, we had to linearize the problem and we reformulated the sharp ratio into a linear format. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. We scaled the problem to 40 stocks and we were so proud. We, uh, we wrote an article and um, we told everyone how we did it because it was really exciting to get it on D-Wave. And then we did 60 stocks and then within a day we, we got it up to 64 stocks. And this runs consistently on the D-Wave, we get great results. We use five different classical solvers as of today, like in production. And 64 stocks, we can do this in less than a minute per method, which is great. We've published ideal portfolios in July and August. And those portfolios have now underperformed the market and the benchmarks through September 16. So we're gonna talk about that because at first they did great. So in the first like couple of days or maybe a couple weeks, but over time, the, the recommendations, it feels like they need to be rebalanced. We then scaled the classical solvers to 1,855 stocks. So that is all New York Stock Exchange common stocks that are not test stocks and that don't have accounting irregularities. The next step is 3,200 stocks, which is the full NASDAQ Q plus New York Stock Exchange common stocks. Once we hit 3,200, we feel like we've got a, a good group of stocks that we can look at, which is all the big ones in the US. And net net, what we found in our last paper is that investors can use either classical methods or quantum annealing computers to build efficient equity portfolios. So what did we accomplish? Again, 40, 60, 64. What's interesting now is we need in order to scale. So we understand the scale challenge. So 64 stocks is great for a typical investor, but maybe not for a Fidelity or a Vanguard. They wanna run a couple thousand stocks. So we can't do it on the Chimera. We, we might be able to get to a few hundred on Pegasus, the new D-Wave. And then the other for us is faster methods. So we've developed a custom simulated bifurcator or a simulated bifurcation model and using quantum walks on graphs and then just accelerating all of our code. And so, and again, just to put it in perspective, we can run 1,855 stocks all in validation, soup to nuts to the report in about an hour. And the last chart is a quote, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Clark. This is a presentation we're giving on Monday in London. 65,000 people received the invitation. It's a financial services executive council. The Bank of England says that this is the room where it happens in England right now in financial services. The webinar will examine what may well be the earliest actual quantum computing calculation or application in finance since they looked in 1998. And I will say that the system is in production. We do have paying clients and we're ready to work with additional paying clients and other researchers who want to learn what we're doing. So let me hand it over to, to Clark. Take it away. Ah, thank you for having me, everyone. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, I think tonight we'll start with, or this afternoon we'll start with, what's a cubo? Right, that's we're going to throw that word around a lot, and uh, in an abusive notation, we will refer to a cubo as the the model itself and the problem and a matrix. So, just be aware. Um, what's a cubo? Uh, it's acronym because everyone loves acronyms, and it has four letters, sadly, instead of three. So it's a quadratic, unconstrained binary optimization. 
So let's just go through those. Quadratic, meaning square. So think about um, ax squared plus bx plus c, something we learned back in third grade or whenever you guys learned it. Everyone smarter than me learned it in second grade. Fine. Now, when you make this a matrix, you don't really multiply x's on the same side. We have this in the formula here, but you know, if you really want to make it succinct, you have x vector times matrix times x vector. Okay, one of them transposed. So you're trying to, that's a quadratic form. Okay, now unconstrained means that uh, you don't have any limits on what the x's necessarily need to be in terms of size or um, if you're looking at some sort of uh, network communication scheduling problem, you would have constraints say, oh, I can't have six workers working on one machine, right? That's a constraint. Here, we don't have those. Binary, that's B. This means that all the, the elements in the vectors X are just zero and one, okay? So I have an unconstrained binary. You don't, they don't have to sum up to a certain thing. The vector doesn't have to sum up to three or five, or just whatever it can be. And optimization is we're trying to find the X that gives us the minimum value of that quadratic form, okay? So for those of you who took linear algebra, you'll know that that's a really simple problem. Very, very, very easy and can be solved in about half a second on a computer if you don't require binary, right? It's very easy. You find the minimum eigenvector and you're done. Literally, it's done. I mean, you can do this on essentially an arbitrary sized matrix. Now that it's binary, well, the eigenvectors don't line up. Um, it becomes a lot more challenging because even though the space is a lot smaller, it's two to the number of dimensions, so two to the 60, in, in physical space, that's not much. That's just a few points. But computationally, that's very expensive. So we, we started with 40 because two to the 40 is about how many you can brute force about how much I can brute force on this laptop here. 60 is beyond that. Can't brute force two to the 60 solutions. And there aren't, um, there are some, but they're not like clever techniques to guarantee a global solution out of a discrete binary thing. So that's why this problem is interesting because in the continuous realm, it's easy, really easy. Uh, in the discrete realm, it becomes all of a sudden very difficult like computationally intractable to, to guarantee a global minimum. Okay, so how do we approach this? We, we have to go through a number of techniques. Okay, so um, let's start with everyone's favorite, this Monte Carlo methods. Okay, um, at a high level, what's, what's Monte Carlo? Monte Carlo, when I was learning it the first time <clears throat> years ago, was uh, described to me as throwing darts at a board. Okay. The very first problem I ever said is, okay, you take a unit square, throw a bajillion darts at it, very technical bajillion, exactly that many. And you say, well, how many are within one unit of the origin and how many are further than that away? Okay, that ratio is going to converge onto about pi over four in area. And that's, that was the first Monte Carlo I was, this is how you calculate pi, right? This is how it was done um, sort of computationally the first time when we were learning to use computers. So literally throwing darts at a board and then kind of counting the averages. Okay, now there are a lot of techniques and all of them is like, if you change the way you throw the darts and if you change the way that you score them, then you get another branch of, off the Monte Carlo, off the Monte Carlo branch of algorithms. Okay, it's a whole family. For us, we're using what are called Markov chain and this means that we just, we take into account the information that we just had. So we don't throw the next dart until we consider the one we just threw. Okay, that's what makes it a Markov chain. Okay, and then annealing, this comes from metallurgy. And so uh, this, this tells us about the way we score and about the way we choose the information to throw the next dart. Okay, so that's, that's where we are. Um, in in so the class, yeah, go ahead, please. Take uh, for everybody in a small interruption and a small comment as well as question so that you can uh, validate our thought process. The algorithm you are discussing here is very much which is kind of people have faced in facing their SAT or GMAT examinations, where when they start getting the few questions initially, 
on the basis of those questions, the level and scoring for the examinee is getting set as to what path the exam will take and how far they can score in that exam. Am I correct on that? Yeah, that's about right. Right, so the... the Just an analogy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So in annealing, in annealing what we have is uh, some parameter, okay? In thermal annealing, we, we have a temperature. So we start our algorithm being hot. and say, okay, take a guess, take another guess, compare them, go, go in the direction of the better one, okay? And then make another guess. Is it better or worse? If better, keep going. If not better, ooh, how much worse is it? If it's, if it's not too much worse, explore here a little bit, then keep going. And, and you keep going and, and the how much worse is determined by some parameter. In thermal annealing, it's a temperature. And in quantum annealing, it's a field tunneling strength. And, and they're, both, they're both Markov chain Monte Carlo annealing methods, okay? Um, and, and the idea is, a simple, is essentially this, you freeze into the best possible solution that you can find probabilistically. You keep going better and if it's worse, explore a little bit and then just keep going as you get better and better, okay? And ideally, you freeze into a very, very, very deep uh, local minimum, hopefully the, the global minimum, but with two to the 60 items, you can't guarantee that, okay? So that's Monte Carlo and annealing. We use all, all manner of these. The strict dart throwing and also uh, simulated annealing, and we also use quantum annealing. So Monte Carlo shows up a lot. Second thing we use, kind of similar, but uh, in, in this case, it's, it's, not, it's not Monte Carlo because it's not really throwing dice. It's a genetic algorithm, and this comes out of uh, biology, really. What we do is we have some population of solutions. We guess a bunch of solutions, a bunch of them, and that's like our initial population, and we score them, and we, we take only the, the sort of let's call it 50 best. Of those 50 best, we, we have a way to take two solutions and generate more solutions, right? So those are called children. And then we also randomly flip once in a while some of the solutions and those are called mutations. So these are, it's, it's like we're simulating a genetic code and we go over many, 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 many generations and hopefully you evolve into a survival of the fittest idea. So the, a good analogy is we're trying to grow the ripest, juiciest, best tomatoes possible. Right, so you, you hybridize tomatoes and then you find the better rootstock and you find the, the ones with the bigger flowers and the juicier ones and you keep combining them and, and every once in a while you'll get a mutation into something that's great. And that's, that's a good analogy for genetic algorithms. So if we, if we just guess randomly, a genetic algorithm does pretty well. But if we give it good solutions to start with, it does great. And so what we do, we call it Saga in-house. We do a simulated annealer to populate the initial population, and then we run the genetic algorithm. That tends to get us better and better and better solutions because we, we never allow anything worse than the best simulated annealer to be our final solution. Okay, so genetic. And now, um, finally, I've, I've been working on this one for a while and we just got it going this week. Um, last year, 2019, I mean, uh, that was like 500 years ago in, in real time, but you know, in publication time, it was just a year ago. Um, Toshiba put out the simulated bifurcation machine. And this is an extremely clever idea. And I think the, the best analogy is, um, if you wanna find the, the least solution, you, you sort of put the boundary and you like pump the air out of it and then it should sort of like can contract onto the best solution. What we're doing here is um, there's, um, in quantum mechanics, the, the nicest best solvable model is the harmonic oscillator, okay? So what we in quantum mechanics have known to, how to do algebraically for 70 years, 80 years is solve the oscillator. So now we add some basic nonlinearities into it. And then we still know how to solve this at least numerically. And what's great is that there are classical solvers for it. So what we do is we, we say, okay, we're gonna let the solutions wiggle a little bit, very slowly. And slowly, we, 
we change the way they're, they're moving by adding in our cubo. Okay, and the cubo then sort of forces the, the solutions to split apart, they bifurcate. And the ones that go up, we end up calling one, and the ones that go down, we end up calling zero. And it just turns out this, this is really brilliant because the numerical solution is a very old numerical ordinary differential equation, which is a dual to the quantum thing. So you don't even have to do the quantum mechanics. You do the classical mechanics, which is extremely well understood, and you use the fastest possible ODE solver because it's numerically stable. And so this thing just spits out answers. I mean, it, it just crushes it. It's great. Um, it wasn't until this week that I figured out why the, the thing I had coded months ago wasn't spitting out the answers that are uh, given in the paper. And it's because the technical paper has a very tiny error. So whoever refereed that, I'm looking at you. Where are the referees? There's a very tiny error in, in equations 12, 13, and 17, just letting you know. So, um, so that's what we're using. Uh, and what we're finding now is that populating a genetic algorithm with both simulated bifurcators and simulated annealers gets the best possible solutions. So we can run this now at, um, I haven't run it on stocks, but on a different set. It has no problem doing 4,000 by 4,000 cubo. I even got a 10,000 by 10,000 to run. I don't know how good the solution is in general, but it, it gave me a very good, at least heuristically, a very good solution on 10,000 assets. So that's, uh, that's where we are on our classical algorithms and our quantum algorithms. Welcome, any questions, I'll try to get them in the chat. So if you so have questions, are, technical or not, ask. Yes, there please. are 10,000 assets you mentioned, that's like the 10,000 stocks you have inputted and you are getting output or where is that 10,000 number going to? I wanted to be very clear for our audience and myself. Okay, for the moment, I don't take 10,000 stocks. I just randomly generate a, what would be a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. Okay. And I symmetrize it, and then I just want to see how deep I can get in a binary model using all the combination of techniques. And sure. it actually runs. It runs. Um, and so on the, on the mark of scalability, the classical algorithms are winning at the moment. Sure. Thank you. Any other so, questions? Anybody? Here's, here's some uh, nice plots of our very new uh, simulated bifurcator. I, I ran these two days ago. So um, you can sort of see um, the, the X's. So we have X and Y. It's a dual. It's a Poisson process in classical physics. You can see they're wiggling around. And over time, I'm adding in the forcing factor of what we're calling the cubo. And it forces the, the solutions to either go up or down. You can see this it does eight by eight, and then I have a 2,000 by 2,000. A little bit harder to distinguish which ones are up and down because of the colorations, 64. You, know, you can also see some of the um, X versus Y. Uh, the ones that are wiggling, the, this is time versus X, and the ones that are, uh, they look like uh, springs or slinkies or something are um, X versus Y. The X's are the ones that give you the classical solution. Okay, so you start them at zero and then you wiggle them around and then they, they literally bifurcate into two classes, plus and minus. Okay, and just for kicks, I tried some bigger ones. I'm gonna go, yeah, 307. So I was working with actual um, data of an electrical grid um, for about five years worth. So these, these are not stocks exactly, but th this is, information. Um, a lot of them are highly correlated and you can see it picked 24 out of 307. So it really is trying to find this sort of minimum correlation. That's what I was running, a minimum correlation. Um, and it runs and it, and it returns results in about a second, about one second. I didn't time it exactly, but it's very, very, very fast. 307 by 307 is, you know, enormous. So and then one more 10,000 by 10,000 just to show that it can be done. So essentially, these are different use cases for the algorithm. Correct. And uh, the question I have is, for example, the grid data you are taking here, there must be some missing values as well for the correlated variables. 
So right, in, in this case, of, the data was all cleaned, and so if there's, if so there's all, missing So stuff, you have so used all clean data, no missing values. Yep. Okay. So all, all that is like being done in the preparation stage Correct. for this simulation. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that you're using all your univariate, bivariate, all those analysis algorithms to make sure everything is cleaned up or any averages are used for the missing values and then you bring in this value for this yep, purpose. That's exactly right. Thank you. Any other question, friends on the call? Otherwise, we'll let Karg barge ahead with the formulation side. So, so this is Jeff, let me just make one comment. We really like questions. So put them in the chat if you have them. Um, we're glad to take them. I think let's allow people to sink it, sink it in and let's keep going and then we can come back to questions further. Is that Clark or you are now handing over to Alex? Clark, are you able to hear us? Yes, yes, yeah, this still is still me. Clark. Okay. Still Clark, okay, please. Right. Sorry, I got uh, distracted in trying to answer um, some of the chat questions. So let me let me okay. come back to here. Right, so what we're looking at is this. Um, we're trying to solve a sharp ratio, which is expected return divided by standard deviation. Okay, so for those of you in information theory, you'll recognize this as Fisher space. Okay, but a quantum computer doesn't divide, right? The classical methods don't have a problem. You say, okay, expected return divided by ratio, the best one, keep going. No problem. But in order to actually benchmark a quantum computer correctly against the classical computer, we want to run the same models. Okay, so what we ended up showing is that we can't properly run the sharp ratio on a quantum computer, so we had to linearize it. Now, what we ended up using is something that Jeff stumbled upon called the, the Chicago quantum net score. Um, if you look at it really closely, it's, um, it's very close to the log of uh, the inverse sharp ratio. Okay, so inverse, you, we, wanna, we wanna maximize the sharp ratio, but a cubo tries to minimize something. So we, we're trying to minimize the inverse, okay? But we can't divide, so we have to take a logarithm. So log of division is a subtraction. So that's, that's kind of where this came from. Now, the two plus alpha, that alpha has to, it has to be a little bit uh, movable so that you can match the values. Otherwise, it will just pick expected return. So. You know, there's, there has to be a little bit of variability on the Chicago quantum net score, but this gives us the linearization that is required to, to formulate a QBO model. Okay, and here are some of the results. Um, what you're seeing, if, if you look closely, you know, you sort, sort of see this square root curve, right? So you have uh, expected return versus standard deviation, right? Standard deviation is roughly X squared. so this, this is called the efficient frontier. Um, and so Jeff has a lot of these um, where you can sort of see the classical methods, the quantum method, and the genetic algorithm. And our methods are brushing up, generally brushing up against the efficient frontier. Right, so we have um, the sharp ratio, if you look into it very deeply, is going to tend to be on the more conservative side. And that's because it favors things with lower volatility. Right, just because it's dividing by that, okay? And uh, as, as you know, working through statistics, the standard deviation is a lot harder to move than the average, right? It's a second order effect. So it's going to pick stuff that's slightly more conservative. So it likes the stuff with lower standard deviation. And you can, you can see this, that's what the square root does. The smaller, the smaller X, the steeper the curve, okay? And so here we have just a bunch of uh, results, these two portfolio things, 30, 150, 414. So you can see how many portfolios we've tested and where they land uh, in the Chicago quantum net score uh, with the different methodologies. I think uh, asking uh, Jeff for the, the pictures, I, I think he has all the pictures. So if you want to see more pretty pictures, one, you could read the paper, that would be awesome. Uh, and two, if you need more and more and more pictures, one, you can hire us and we can present pictures for you. Or two, um, you know, you can read the paper or ask us. Um, lots, lots of ways to get more pretty pictures. 
in fact, this last picture, so before I hand it over to Alex, so we ran 115 quantum portfolios versus 1,630,000 Monte Carlo. And the good news is, is that um, all three methods, generally speaking, found about the same solution but it's amazing how the red is the 115 solutions. So it was close to the efficient frontier uh, along the range of standard deviations you would expect. The blue are the genetic algorithm, the simulated annealer. Um, so you can see those generally had lower standard deviations. And um, yeah, it, it doesn't take many quantum solutions to basically validate the best answers. And if we were to let it run and got, let's say, 50,000 quantum portfolios, we would most likely look where the, the quantum dots, the red dots, would completely overwhelm and even extend further than the Monte Carlo solutions. And so this was our validation that even though we converted to something else, a linearization, the quantum computer is giving us the best linearization, but it's also pretty much the best sharp ratio. And that was a surprise for us. We, we got something right on that one. And we're not random. When, and just to prove it, 30 quantum portfolios versus 115,000 Monte Carlo, the red are grouped right on that efficient frontier. This is not a random solver. This is like a knowledgeable solver that's going right for the best answers all the time. And that gave us a lot of confidence. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Alex. And Alex is gonna talk about the value we create classically and with quantum. Go and ahead, while, Alex. While we're getting here, just please uh, chat and I'll answer away as we can. Uh, take it away, Alex. All right, well, thank you, uh, Jeff. Um, I think the, the, the bar has been already set for me because we got a question already about what is the implication for this on quantum advantage. So that is, that's a question that we have been asking ourselves all along. And I, the, Jeff, you can go to the next slide. Um, and I think um, I want to answer that question, but we'll do it in, in two ways. One, I think we're going to reveal kind of the work that it takes to produce the answer. And you know, if you ask what's the advantage, I think it's a, it's a fair question to ask how much computation did you have to do to get the answer? And you should think in terms of what's the work you have to do before you give, the answer, give your formulation to a quantum processor, and then you know, what was the cost or benefit of the quantum processor? So it's not really fair if you did a lot of processing and you literally have the answer and then you give it to the quantum computer and it just takes two seconds and gives you, gives you an answer. Is that really a quantum advantage? So in my discussion, I think we're gonna talk about a lot of different variables that you have to think about and it is really up to you to determine whether you are getting an advantage or if you're getting a quantum advantage. But we're gonna talk about what are the steps that one should take to actually solve these kind of problems. Um, at a high level, uh, you should understand your problem classically. Um, I've seen, um, actually I've been consulting in this area now, so I've seen a lot of teams that are in some code or their customer will give them some code and they'll say, I want you to do this on a quantum computer. So the team will take the code or what they understand of the code and they'll try to find an example out there of somebody who's converted, a, you know, use a Cubo or some Cubo formulation, and they'll try to get an answer from D-Wave right away and then say, oh, look, I'm getting some results. So that is not the approach one should be taking. And because you don't know what you're gonna get and you don't know if it's right. So the, at a high level, you have to understand your classical problem you're gonna to have to build the Cubo. So if you use any of the tools we're talking about, the has, you, know, you have to build the Cubo, which is an art and a science, and um, it has its own limitations as well. So the Cubo has to be built. So you have to understand your math before you can build the, build the Cubo. And you should understand that classically. Only then would you want to give that Cubo to a quantum solver or any of the other tools, the genetic or the simulated bifurcation or uh, any of the other ones. 
So we will go quickly through those process. And then we'll talk about, okay, so then how do you know if you're getting value out of this or not? All right, Jeff. So first of all, understanding your cal uh, classical formulation. Like I mentioned, if you just start with some code, you don't really know what's the math that's happening behind there. And in the end, you have to build the objective function. And that objective function is which is going to go on to a cubo eventually. But a lot of teams I've noticed don't even know what they're really trying to maximize. In our case, we had the sharp ratio. We had to really understand, literally go back to our finance books and re-understand. It's like learning to walk again. Re-understand what the sharp ratio really is. You have to get to the math. And I will say that the sharp ratio is a much easier formulation than a lot of real world problems. So get to understand that. Then get to understand what are you doing with that? Are you finding the maximum? Are you trying to find the minimum? Because most of these solvers, you know, they'll either do the maximum or they're gonna do the minimum. In the case of D-Wave, it finds the minimum energy of a landscape. Um, and then use classical solvers to really understand the problem. We had to put our calculations on an Excel spreadsheet and it's almost like going back into finance class and understand exactly what we were doing. We wanted to know what was the right answer before we took the next step. Um, we, so we used Excel. We put you know, the, our formulation on Excel, looked at, the she, uh, looked at the cells, put the calculations in. Then we added solver to that. Uh, we tried to look at, okay, if you had different portfolios, how would solver solve that problem? How would solver get to the minimum, or in that case, the maximum shop ratio? And again, you know, beginning to understand the dynamics of the problem itself and what we're trying to solve. Now, solver is very easy to put it together. It's easy to communicate with the stakeholder, but solver will get stuck in local minimums. And so you get an answer. It's not a very good answer. And you have to keep teasing it and starting it over and again, or starting with different values and letting it evolve to try to get it to the best answer. And other times we just have to put the values in manually and say, okay, I can do better just manually. So, but the point really is we got to really understand the problem we were trying to solve. And uh, during that time, we also introduced a simulated annealer, we introduced the genetic algorithm. All of these were tools to help us get better answers and clarity of what the problem we're solving. Okay, next. Alex, one question here. Mm -hmm. As you were saying about the solving through the solver and there is a curve and there is a point you are trying to arrive at, is there anywhere in between, I mean, I'm, I'm taking a speculation here because I don't know exactly what algorithms and what is built on here from that angle. The sigmoid curve is the most important curve in the world, which we always try to look at. And then we try to take the linear piece. Is that something that which is happening here from the sigmoid, we're taking the linear piece and trying to come to that uh, stable portion of that or uh, minimal value or that's not in the picture here? So Clark can answer the sigmoid part, but okay. I will say that in our formulation, I mean, we're just trying to find the minimum. You know, so right. in D-Wave, you're finding, always finding the minimum. Now the sharp ratio, technically, we're trying to find the maximum sharp ratio. So you right. have to inverse it, right? You have to use a negative sign to get it to go from the maximum sharp ratio to a minimum energy landscape. To get to the risk-free investment. Yeah. So, um, now with, uh, with solver or with brute force, I mean, brute force is a good example. If you know your formulation, you know what your sharp ratio calculation is, you can, you know, you can put in different uh, combinations of stocks and literally calculate depending on the weight, depending on the, the variance terms, depending on you know, the, the expected return, you can calculate what would be the sharp ratio of some combination. Right. And you can brute force this by going through all the different combinations, right? You can use every single combination possible up to, I think Clark mentioned up to like 30 or 40, up to 40, you could probably do brute force. Now, Jeff was doing that many times and he was using up his, you know, letting his Macintosh run, 
run constantly trying to get the brute force. And why, why did we spend this much time? We spent a lot of time. But again, the point was we wanted to know what the best answer was. Because when we look at it through D-Wave's eyes, right, we want to see, does D-Wave see the best answer that we're seeing? How would we know if D-Wave is doing the right thing? So I think, um, uh, to your point, um, you know, we are trying to find the maximum. I mean, there is, there is a curve, and we are trying to make sure we understand for a certain example, what is the maximum. Um, I want to tell another story here. I, I mentioned here that, you know, find the best value against live data. Jeff made a lot of effort to get live data in early. I mean, we, we, we used random initially, random values to test things. But we very quickly started bringing in live data from the market. Um, so, I mean, I know of a company that started with some code, created a formulation, said, hey, I can, you know, we can put this on D-Wave, we can pattern this formulation, but they couldn't find live data to validate their formulation. So, and, and they shut down. All right, so we can, <laughs> we can continue. So, so the, the, the connected question we have here is, when we come to the Sharpie ratios and finding the solution, now we know, even if we go back a few years, for example, SMP, Sharpie ratio from 1.0 and the frequent periods where it was at higher and lower levels, and now come to the current present context, where we know we are into very, very, I would say, I don't know how to interpret the current. Uh, I haven't seen the exact Sharpie ratios for the current S&P for the current week or so. And Jeff, please add to that. So when that piece has gone that far and that exceptionally as an outlier situation, how is the current mix of 40 or 60 or whatever stocks we are taking as an example here is faring in our results? And do you have any sample recommendations to share here with our I can I can answer your question. So sure. if I were to ask you to remember in no, in March, COVID hit and the market crashed. Yeah. And then from March, it's been an upward curve. And then just recently, we've had some bad volatility. Yeah. So here's what happened. We built the model during the best of times and the worst of times. Perfect. And the, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and the power, the power value. So when we do variance minus expected return to a power, we've learned that we have to modify that power based on the stocks that a client recommends. So um, if the market's going up a lot, the power needs to be higher because the expected returns overwhelm the variance. If the stock market's terrible, the power should be small because your expected returns might be six or 7% against the variance. And so the way it manifests itself is the sharp ratio almost never changes its shape. Since I've been doing this work, I put a little bar on top just to show you. There's very few great sharp ratios. There's lots of good ones though, lots of very good ones. So you could almost do a Monte Carlo with 50,000 hits in a quarter of a second, it's good enough. You're not gonna make a lot of money, but you're not gonna do badly. By the way, you can lose a ton of money in that sharp ratio on small portfolios. But this chart changes shape. So this is the Chicago quantum net score. Remember, lower is better. And this is your Monte Carlo over your discrete N over two. And it's all right around that average. By the way, you could just pick all 60 stocks and be at the average. But if you can find a couple of these portfolios that are small, you could do really well. These are ones where I like to say it's like two, it's like fish that swim in a school, but some fish zig when the other zag. And so the pattern is such that they cancel out each other's variances. And so the stocks don't go down on the same day. And so you can sometimes find it, but if you're not careful, 
you find some of these stocks, which is small portfolios, which do terrible. So if you're gonna just pick small portfolios, you're really taking a risk. When the market changes and goes up and down, this plot, which is cheap to run, this tail can become very short. It could say there aren't very many good Chicago quantum net score portfolios, or I've seen the tail move. And so it's eight stocks or 10 stocks are the best. And so we calibrate our runs with the Chicago quantum, the power score. And we look for how deep that minimum is in the Monte Carlo runs. And then we run it through the quantum. So we have to adjust. So last call we were on, Keeper Sharkey asked the question. We were on a call with the Federal Reserve Bank for an hour and we danced around the same topic. What do you do when the market crashes and when the market goes up? And the answer is you adjust the Chicago quantum net score. So I have two comments and questions just to further this discussion. Yep. Value versus growth stocks. There's a lot of discussion nowadays going on and then in such situation, where do you come in and how do you help in balancing the portfolio and how often do you need to do that with this kind of uh, recommendation from your D-Wave computing? So, so I'm gonna answer the second one first. Sure. So, and I have data. Awesome. So the first portfolio that we published, and by the way, all these results are on Medium. We publish it on Medium you can't take it back, it's out there, right? So after 25 trading days, our quantum portfolio killed the market. We did 14% return versus a market of seven. We were heroes. I was gonna buy a, a G7 with all the profit I was gonna make. But that, if I put it into perspective, 253 trading days versus 25 trading days moving forward, so it's a 10%, that felt good. The, the trend, the short-term trend of 10% of seemed good. After 48 trading days, or about 20%, the Chicago quantum net score started to behave differently. There was news. That kills you. There's news on the stocks, right? The CEO yep. does something stupid. So now, the price of oil <laughs> drops. APA drops. So now your two stock portfolio underperformed the market. So what I would say is, is this is a rebalancing strategy, but actually it's not a long-term rebalance. It's a short-term rebalancing sure. strategy. We learned that. And um, so I would say 10%, 15%. Now the second question was on value versus growth stocks. So from our client runs, what I can tell you is this. Um, beta is the um, market momentum. So a high beta greater than one means that if the stock market goes up 1%, then this stock goes up maybe one point something. A beta of two would say it goes up 2%. So we get clients throwing in really high beta stocks and really low beta stocks. Like the lowest one I saw this week was 0 0.06 beta those get ignored. What happens is, is that it seems like you're picking relatively high beta, but not the highest. So I guess that would be your growth stocks because those are gonna be the ones that move the most with the market. So is that the reason for your stock portfolio? You are picking beta between zero and 10? So the reason, well, um, I've, I've loosened up the, the controls now that we're dealing with real clients. Right. Beta just has to be positive. Between so, zero and 10. That was no, no, it could be higher than 10. If they okay. want to pick an anomaly stock, let them. Tesla. Because, because it was sometime in the past, something happened, right? But um, we'll let them know if there's a really high beta in there. So, so far I'm seeing beta as, um, the professional money manager had a beta of like 2.2. The other one was 1.5, 1.6. So th they're not putting in crazy stocks because they probably wouldn't put their clients' money into those crazy stocks anyway. Um, 
So, but it doesn't matter. If you put in a really high beta stock and there's another stock that offsets its variance, that's probably a win-win. And that's why you tend to think that in case of pure stock portfolio number, where the classical recommendation is to go about 30 stocks and you are going beyond that into 40s and even more. Well, this is, so yes and no, I wanna be, uh, I wanna be careful. It's not classical versus quantum. Mm -hmm. It's the it's depth. The it's the it's the Chicago quantum net score versus the sharp ratio. And if we had a client that says, "I don't like your quantum your your Chicago quantum net score," I want client X net score, and they give us a different formulation. We can do that. Um, the the quantum results independently are giving us very similar results as our classical. And so, so that brings me to another question here. And since we still have our benchmark slide on, and that's tempting me to ask that question. Go ahead. I, I was uh, watching one recording uh, a few evenings back from summer school of CNBC on the stocks and where they mentioned, and we all know it, that these markets have been really on this curve for quite some time. And it's, it's an easy run and even a lot of millennials are coming into the market, coming as stock slicing or whatever method, but they are getting into it, making some money. And, and that is very much in unison with the results you have posted here on this slide, where initial trading days versus a glitch, a CEO making some comments, mistake or some tweet causing some general, some I would say perturbation in the language of quantum yeah. here and that perturbation and then now 48 days later, the same thing is doing worse than the market. So do you think anywhere that kind of luck is playing for us also still in this stock so, recommendation so or is it that no, we, we really have some solid ground here to claim and you have done those validation on the past data as well running your uh, results. So I need to show you a tweet that I put in the market a few days ago Right. which answered your question and in fact has been very well liked. So what we found, what this chart is showing you is the S&P 500 over the same one year period and it's showing you in blue and by size, so I'm sorry, in green is the big winners and red is the big losers and the size of the tiles is the market cap. So obviously a bigger Amazon is up 68.7% and it's a very large portion of the value of the stock market. But then you look down here and you look at like uh, Exxon Mobil is pretty small and it's very red. So it's not done very well. So the tweet that I sent was that this shows that in the past year, it's been a sector based market. Correct. Technology. All you had to do was pick the right sector. Oh, I'm a tech guy. I'm into communication services because we're all working from home versus financial stocks and banks are terrible right now. Interest rates are in the toilet, right? What am I doing? Energy, gold, defense stocks. So this is what, what happens is um, you could get lucky. The Chicago quantum net score and actually what we're proposing, our model, is not to get caught up in the stories. Correct. It's right. It's not even to listen to your, I mean, always have a financial analyst, especially if you pay him a lot of money or pay her a lot of money, listen carefully. But I hear a lot of financial analysts say things that sound like mystery and magic. You shouldn't pick stocks based on mystery and magic. You should look for the patterns, the patterns behind the movements of the stock prices. And those patterns don't lie, especially if you see consistency over a year. And that's what we're proposing is if we can use a quantum computer or classical, find those patterns and they're clear and they're like this where it's standard deviations away, then you take a risk and you buy that clarity because you're gonna get a better result. That's what we're proposing. 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank All you right. for the clarification. Only question I had, which you, you may answer later also is, when we are making these recommendations for the stocks and as per your tiles and sizing and everything, if I assumed I put $10,000 and now you want to put $10,000 versus the number of stocks or you are saying, no, this is my portfolio and I'm putting the uniform distribution in all these stocks for the money which I hold in the portfolio. Anytime you can answer that question. Alex is <laughs> smiling. I know. I, and I need to, I need, I need to give these questions internally. <laughs> you, you know what? Um, I'll do a quick answer and then I'm going to give the floor back to Alex. Cause he's actually okay. been, he actually uh, did like one stock at a time and looked at like one share, things like that. But mm -hmm. the net of this is, is if I go all the way back to the initial formulation of the sharp ratio, on slide 12. So focus on sharp, don't focus on Chicago quantum net score for a minute. Um, you see a W and the W, I'm gonna zoom all the way in even more because sometimes it's hard to read the, uh, the math here. So the sharp ratio is a weighted portfolio and it's the weight times beta times the expected return I get from the whole market, from holding the market, the risky part. And then I add back the risk-free part over the standard deviation. And that weight in our model is the same percentage for every stock. Thank you. I wanted to have the confirmation. I saw the formula. Perfect. Got it. Yeah. And then we do the same formulation for the Chicago quantum net score. So 10 stocks is 10% of your $10,000. You know, okay. 20 stocks is 5% each. All right, let me go back to 100%, 100, let's say 115% if I can. And then let's uh, give the floor back to Alex. Absolutely, please, Alex, take it away. As no, as, yep, there's a lot here. So there's always a lot to- uh, uh, you, um, let me And know I definitely you know want to request participants again, please throw your questions in the chat or interrupt. So we, we have some more lively discussion here. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, just going back, we were talking about make sure you understand your classical formulation first. That's step one. Now is building the cubo. And Clark already explained what the cubo is mathematically. This diagram over here, which uh, shows an Excel spreadsheet, shows you what uh, a cubo looks like when you're working with it. And all it really is is uh, a matrix with uh, N by N. It's a square matrix and it's symmetrical. If you look at the values on either side of the diagonal, which is the highlighted values, um, they are the same. They're mirror, you know, they're image, mirror images or symmetrical along, along that diagonal. Um, the diagonal terms are called the linear terms. Those are the values on the asset. So our formulation has to take from the <clears throat> from the variance and the standard deviation in the formulation, you have to take a portion of that and put it on the asset itself. And then you look at the, those are linear contribution of the asset. And then you look at what is the contribution between the assets. So how does one asset affect the other one? And you know, that's the variance uh, or the covariance terms. Uh, it's the interaction between the assets. Those are the nonlinear terms, which you see on the, you know, the left side or the right side, depending on where you're looking. <clears throat> so, so <clears throat> excuse me. In the end, whatever your formulation is, whether sharp ratio or CQNS, all of that has to convert into a matrix that looks like this. And all of your covariance terms or standard deviation terms or uh, expected return terms have to come into some way through an addition problem into this. So, so that is the trick. And if you think about it, it's also kind of a, it's kind of a bottleneck because you might have all kinds of interesting variables in your formulation classically, but somehow in your cubo, this is all you can work with. So, the cubo basically adds up the linear terms depending on what you pick. So if you pick one and two, then you have the 0.5 and the negative 0.6 adding up. And then you have the contribution term, the covariance term like the 0.15, uh, 
that goes with it. And you're adding up the energies and then you're finding the minimum based on the selection of the different assets. And that's, that's basically what you have to solve um, if you have any constraints. So for example, if you have a constraint that says, in, in some problems as constraints that say you want to solve it by, um, you know, you, let's say you want to have a certain amount of money that you put in and you want to distribute the money equally, that's what we're doing. But you might also have another one that's where you're just picking different stocks and uh, or shares and then you have a dollar amount. So that would totally change this cubo. You might also say that you want to have 10 asset answers. Well, if you only want 10 asset answers, you're putting a constraint. And so you have to put that constraint into this formulation. So those are things that you have to look at. And that's like very much in uh, sync with regular optimization function with the constraints you keep adding. Is that something? Yeah, I mean, you would put those same constraints on your regular optimization function, but keep in mind that when you're doing it classically, you have so yeah. many options. You've got all kinds of equations you can use. You can use if statements, but when you're doing it with a cubo, you have to have the cubo built properly and then you right. can run it. Of course, you have to map it as per cubo requirements. Right. And in my mind, I think we, as we're going through this um, topic, keep thinking about the classical, or think about the work you have to do up front to build this data into this matrix. And then think about all the solvers that are available that can solve this matrix. And that's the, I think the best way to think about this method. All right, Clark, uh, Jeff, we can go to the next And one. then code your own. <laughs> or code your own. I mean, I coded my own. Jeff coded his own. I mean, we, we all coded our own. Um, okay, so now <clears throat> when you build a cubo, in the, in, in, initially it was all blind. I mean, we had a cubo and we were randomly selecting values and getting, getting answers and we didn't know what was right and what wasn't right. But what we needed was to visualize the landscape. And you know, when you're dealing with uh, quantum solvers, they talk about the landscape and you know, there's hills and valleys and you want to find the minimum, the global minimum. Well, <clears throat> we wanted to see that ourselves to see what does that landscape look like? So in the plots on the right, the blue, the blue um, plot is, a, is sorted by the number of assets in the solution. So on the left side of that is one asset answers. And then on the right side of that, where the blue line is going down is the total asset. So all assets are selected. And so you can see that depending on how you build a cubo, you can have it look like that. I mean, every, every cubo looks different. Ours initially started out that way. And what you will notice is that if you were to give that landscape to D-Wave or to any solver, it will always pick all assets because that's the minimum. The minimum is where all assets are selected. And Obviously, you can, you can use a cubo solver and you keep getting ones, or it could be the other way where your zero is the best answer and you get nothing. But what you're looking for is the best based on some kind of constraint. And so we had to introduce a constraint where we said, we want the best answer at two assets. Like our answer should have two assets in it, or three assets, or four assets, or five assets. And so what you see is the, the, the red marker. The red marker is where we want the answer. We want four asset answers, or in that case, I think it's 20 asset answers. And then at the bottom, you see where we're saying we want 40 asset answers, where you, know, you could have a total of 50 assets. Well, you can never get that answer if your minimum is at that tip at the bottom of the blue landscape. So we had to do an affine transformation. We had to transform our matrix in such a way that the minimum value, the value we're looking for sits in the, at the bottom of that landscape. And so it, these are some of the lessons we learned and for every problem, it would be different. Um, your initial landscape would be different. What you want to get, what answers you're looking for would be different, but you have, might have to do some either transformations or put some constraints, or it's also called penalties, add some penalty to make sure that you are 
your answer is where it should be. So let me add a uh, let me add a thought here. So the penalties are maybe the right way to think about it. We we had an interesting case recently. So the market had dropped. The CQNS scores had gone positive. So what's the minimum score? Zero stocks. That's not helpful. So there's one thing that says, know your right answer. By the way, I think if you go back to the, to the Cubo you laid out, it was a one or two stock solution. I did the math in my head. And so. Is it basically telling you that sit on the sideline with your money? <laughs> Well, but, not really. Not really. It isn't, but the, this is the math, yeah, right? The so, lowest, the, but that is the lowest volatility portfolio. I mean, right? <laughs> Correct, yeah, yeah. So, so there's, there's two things. Like mathematically, yes, but as investment advice, no. No. <laughs> right. Correct. So you got to know, like, what's the right answer here? Now, let's say you had one stock that had a beta of five and the market's going up 20% a year, and that stock's gonna go up 100%. I don't care what the variance of that stock is, you're probably gonna pick that one. So what you do is you change the power, and now you kind of lower the, the weight of the expected return, and now the variance becomes more important, and so what we call this for the widows and orphans. You still might wanna have some of that 100% profit stock, but you may want some other stocks in there too. And so you can use the power to, to make it larger and larger portfolios that get selected. That's what makes this powerful. And the transformation that Alex is talking about is that, so we're doing that kind of reshape of the problem. You still have to make sure that D-Wave is going to find that answer. So that's what the affine transformation does is it increases the likelihood the D wave will find that answer the first time you run it. Yep. Um, and, I, and I will say that uh, as you can see where it's red, those values are exactly the same between the blue and the green. So as we transform, we are not losing accuracy of the values that we are looking for because you could do a transform where you move, move the whole curve upwards and now your energy is energy values are not the same anymore. So we, we ensured that we didn't use any transformation where what we're looking for changed. Um, so again, you can see that there's a lot of pre-processing happening here, right? So as we're talking about quantum advantage and you're thinking about the value of this, keep thinking about all the things we we're doing before versus what's gonna happen after we send it to a um, D-Wave or to any other Cubo solver. So, but again, we ran the Cubo through classically. We, we looked at plots, we looked at values, we ran through the same, all of our classical, we ran through all of our solvers, the genetic, the simulated annealer, and we made sure that the answer we were getting classically is the same as the answer we're getting through the Cubo. I mean, think about it, if your Cubo now suddenly is giving you the different answer, something went wrong, right? Your, your transformation probably isn't correct. So we ensured that we were getting the right values. Okay, so next, Jeff. Now we were ready for uh, going to a quantum computer. So now when we put this into D-Wave, we're dealing with D-Wave's hardware limitations as well. Uh, Jeff already talked about the connectivity between the qubits. Because there are limited connectivity between the qubits uh, in that chimera architecture, one asset gets spread amongst diff many uh, qubits, and I'm, I'm going to go through this really quickly, but the point is that you are introducing errors and just uh, behavior of the hardware itself. So understanding what answers you should be getting is very important because d will give you answers. You have to know what is it giving, what is it seeing, and is that correct or not? And Jeff will have slides of graphs and plots of what D-Wave gave us so that you can see kind of how we interpret that. Um, the other point here is that D-Wave gives us its own parameters, like the number of samples you do, the annealing time, the, the chain strength to ensure that one asset is 
consistent amongst all the qubits. So we have different ways in which we can tweak the quantum hardware to get the best result. And we know when we're seeing the best result because we've done this classically, you know, both through the um, regular formulation and the cubo formulation. And then we had opportunities for trying different solvers to see what results we get from those. And we can compare the value uh, and benefits of each of those solutions. Okay, Jeff, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, so after we've done that, now we can think about scaling. So as Jeff mentioned, we started with 40, then we went to 60, then I went to 72 and I said, Jeff, we broke it. And Jeff's like, what? <laughs> so then, <laughs> and I'm like, I did 72 and it doesn't go to 72. So <clears throat> then he tried it and he couldn't do 72 and then he had to scale back to 65. And so we, <laughs> I mean, this is really funny because you would think that we should have known this when we started, but everything has been a learning curve. <clears throat> and for a fully connected matrix where every value is dependent on every other value and they're connected in some way, you can only go to a 65 by 65 matrix. You cannot go beyond because in order to translate that into the embedding of D-Wave's Chimera, D-Wave uses up all of the 2,041 qubits that are active and available to us. So it is very important to look at your formulation and how does it really scale? Because as you saw, the cubo is a bottleneck. I mean, you only get certain values that you can put on there. And you can't put any if statements, you know, if this, then do this, and if that, then do that. You, you, you have one shot. You build the matrix, you run it through the solver. And as we go to from 40 to 60, we are not introducing, our problem is an N by N. I mean, it's just growing by the number of assets. However, D-Wave's hardware doesn't solve N by N. It is losing qubits as you increase the number of assets. So by the time you get to 65, you, you've used up 2,000 qubits. Technically, if they were all fully connected, you would only have used 65 qubits. But that is not the case, not with their hardware. So you have to think about you know, the, all of these different dynamics and uh, um, con, con, you know, just have to consider all of these different things. Your formulation, if it has a certain kind of uh, constraint, could be using additional qubits to manage the constraint. In our case, that's not the case because the, the way we did formulation, but I've seen other problems like the knapsack problem or other formulations when you convert them, they use extra qubits beyond your variables to manage that formulation. So you could be losing qubits for many reasons. Um, okay, so we can go to the next one. So now we get into the topic of, so how, what value are you getting? What is the value of um, solving this through quantum? What is the value of converting this to a cubo, which as I've kind of tried to, hopefully given the message that there's a, you're using up resources just to get to the cubo, and the cubo itself is a, is a bottleneck. Um, so you have to look at your time and effort and resources to solve the problem, uh, to use a quantum annealer. Um, and you know, is your data, is how, what kind of data you have available to actually solve this, compare the, the costs and benefits of you know, just solving it directly the way you're doing classically and then solving it through you know, the annealer or some other method. So, and then I think that another important thing we learned is there's a difference between the value of the ideal solution, which might be just one value, and the value of many solutions that might be very good answers. So just think about that. All right, um, Jeff, next. So, um, so let's, let's just think about um, when your problem is, let's say a 60, you've got 60 assets, which is a 60 by 60 matrix. Um, on the right side, I'm showing the number of so possible solutions for the number of uh, asset portfolios that are in the answer. So if you have 60 by 60 or 60 is your universe of assets that you're picking from and you want an 11 asset portfolio, 
you have three four two seven zero zero one two five three zero zero possible combinations. combinations. All right, that is a huge number. And to find, let's say, the 10 best out of that itself is a technically challenging problem. And what we're doing is we're not only saying, I want the top 11 asset portfolios. I'm wanting the top 11, the 10, the 9, the 8, and I want the top global asset, um, the best asset portfolio as well. So, so that, you know, that needs to be looked at. Now, I want to talk about the value of the Cubel method. If your problem can efficiently map onto the Cubel, there are a lot of really efficient Cubel solvers. D-Wave is one of them, but you've got genetic, you've got uh, simulated annealing, you've got our own bespoke simulated annealing, you've got a combination where you do, you know, one simulated and get some genetic values and then seed the genetic with the simulated and then get another set of values. You've got the, uh, you've got the, um, the bifurcation machine as well. Um, there are- you've, you've also got the Fujitsu. So the Fujitsu, right. You've got the Digital the Fujitsu annealer. and others, right? Yep. So the first thing to think about, what is the value of even going down this path? There are some really good and really efficient and fast Cubo solvers in the market. If your formulation can somehow efficiently convert into a Cubo, where there are you know, relationships between assets, or in, it couldn't be, it might be something else, it might be traffic signals or cities or something else. If that converts into Cubo really well, you have a lot of options. And the quantum method of solving a Cubo is it's most likely a very good option. I mean, there was proofs that quantum annealing would be better than stimulated annealing. Of course, there are hardware engineering constraints, but in the future, it could be a very good option. Now, Clark is looking at the stimulated bifurcation machine and that solves the answer literally by the, you know, in the blink of an eye. So yes, quantum is probably not as good as the stimulated bifurcation machine right now, but it gives us some really good answers what it does is if you're looking for 16 acid answers, we can sample a thousand times. So we put a thousand samples into D-Wave and you'll get thousand really good answers right away. I mean, within seconds. So that is value. Um, so what is the quality of the answers coming from D-Wave compared to classical? So assuming that you, know, you, you bought into the Cubo method and now you're saying, okay, well, what's the value of D-Wave? Since D-Wave is using this quantum tunneling, as Jeff showed on the efficient frontier, just 30 answers were really good answers. With a simulated annealer, you might not get the best answer, and especially as your number of assets increases, or with a combination like Clark has a combination where you do genetic, simulated, simulated bifurcation, you could get a really good answer. We're not sure if it's the best answer. However, it's only one answer. So you have to balance between one good answer, one answer you're not sure if it's the best, and a thousand really good answers that you get really cheap very quickly from D-Wave. Okay, so uh, next, uh, Jeff. And then finally, what's the value of the CQNS? So we've looked at a number of portfolios now. And on the right side, you can see these plots of the performance of certain portfolios. And these are just example portfolios. I picked a, a Fidelity portfolio, took out the best, sorry, the top 100 assets in there and plotted that. And then we ran through our genetic solver and we, we got an answer. And then we created a portfolio and looked at the performance of that. And you can see that it had a good performance. Now you could also say to me, Alex, well, you looked at one year of past data. And then of course you can use any tool to find what would be, have been the best asset portfolio out of that. But the first thing is, can you find the best asset portfolio from historic data? And yes, we can do that. 
then the question is, what's the value of that for the future? So as we were kind of getting into it, we believe that because of the average correlation, you know, between the behavior of these assets, you can use that correlation. That that's a good representation of the behavior in the future, at least for a short time. And so that is the real value of the CQNS. The better the CQNS score, again, with the right tweaking on the power, it will meet the objectives of the investor and we can find some really good answers because we can use different methods to find the really good, you know, those, uh, those jewels in those huge landscape of potential answers that you can find them and then you can use them as, um, as a starting point. And, I, and Clark and I were having a discussion where I was saying, you know, it's like when you're working with a team and you, you, um, you do all of this uh, exercise and preparation before the match. And what this is, is finding the right team and training the team to be able to have a good game. You don't know the outcome of the game, but your team is ready to be able to handle the risk and the uncertainty that we'll, that we'll get. And that's what we're doing, is finding a winning team that has at least a chance of winning in the future. Now, again, we can't predict what the future will be, but you have a solid team at least for a certain amount of time. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Alex. I think uh, we have plenty of uh, participants here, and uh, if you have not had a chance to ask questions, general questions related to the model, absolutely go ahead, otherwise I'll still have a few questions. Yeah, please. Uh... Hit us in the chat. I'm, I'm waiting yep. for good questions. All right, and I'm going to accelerate my pace yep. to try and uh, give you guys some good stuff here. So I'm, I'm going to assume that um, you read faster than I talk. That would be a good challenge. 60 stocks, how'd we do? So this is in the paper. It took seven seconds to use a genetic algorithm. We got the best solution. Took 11 seconds for the simulated annealer that D-Wave gave us and 15 seconds for our own. The Monte Carlo took 24 seconds and then our quantum annealer took 21. That is an accumulation of all the runs we had to do, including the calibration run. We figured it'd be 15 seconds moving forward. So this was kind of state of play, 60 stocks. Now, a little different. The genetic algorithm is faster. The simulated annealer is faster. And to be honest, we can run the quantum annealer now with a little more, a little less calibration, maybe six seconds. I'm getting the best, the best I can give to a client. So we've gotten better at this. 64 stocks, 60 stocks is easy now for us. We picked two stocks. That was because we used um, a power ratio, a power score of two, I'm sorry, of three. And as the market kept going up, we were driving towards expected returns. And so the way you know that this isn't random, a taboo sampler is pretty random. The taboo sampler picked a ton of assets. That's probably like 30 stocks, which is his average, right? That's fine. If I keep going, when we first came out with this model, it was in an upward moving market and the two stocks did great. They outperformed and in part because they avoided some of the hiccups that the market had. <clears throat> when the market would drop, these two wouldn't drop. Maybe one would drop a little, the other one would go up. So they avoided mishaps. Um, but the more the market kept going up, the smaller the portfolio. So state of play, two stocks, you really lose any benefit of diversification. And what we found is after 48 trading days, like you said, something happens. The, the price of oil drops or the CEO says something and it's, a, it's an anomaly event. And so at 25 days, we look like heroes. At 48 days, the, the ideal portfolio is down almost 1% versus 4.4% up for if you just held all the stocks. And what's interesting is the Chicago quantum ratio, which is a, which is a clean proxy of the sharp ratio, um, still beat the market. 
So we produce as a byproduct of our runs, the Chicago quantum ratio and the Chicago quantum net score. And we could provide both of those to a client. And um, in fact, if you would have put half your money in the CQNS and half your money in the CQR, you might've, uh, you might've done well. So we that's a, a very short term, Jeff. Uh, that's a very short term for the two stocks. If we had diverted all the money means we have increased the risk by reducing the number of stocks in the slightly longer term also. Is that true? It, it's Again, very... taking, take, taking into the real e economical and the typical anomaly situations in the market. Generally speaking, that's true. For, for just, I'm just talking time series here, not even stocks, but that's, that's about right. And so the idea here is if you could have earned this extra 7% in a month, you take it. Because over the course of a year, you've made 100% more. But your risk went up. So you're right. If you can, if you can pick tomorrow's winner or next month's winner, that's what this seems, the way it was tuned at this time, that's what it was doing. Yeah, something I mean, on the taboo sampler, the reason that it picks about half the stocks is, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier to pick about 30 out of 60 stocks, which have uh, a very, very, very low covariance taken yeah. together. Right. But the, the expected return drops faster than the square of the, the variance. So uh, the square of the uh, is drops faster than the variance. So the, the net score goes, uh, the, the uh, sharp ratio doesn't get as big a mark, but it's easy to pick a well diversified, low risk portfolio of a lot of stocks. It just doesn't necessarily outperform the market much. It's just a good proxy for the market, which is a smaller investment set. So and your statement is absolute, prices. sorry. And your statement Clark is absolutely true as long as Volatility is in control, market volatility. That's right. But, you know, you have a lot of mitigating factors with a larger portfolio. If you pick a thousand stocks, Correct. yeah, one, one volatile stock doesn't really Agreed. move the covariance much, but it does move the expected return further down. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Jeff. Sorry. To interrupt. So, no, it's okay. Um, the next one was run on August 28. So this is a declining portfolio. I didn't know it was going to be declining. But uh, this is during a recent uh, downturn in the market. So it's 13 trading days. And, and I'm, I ran this because we're going to be speaking at the FS Club, which is in London, on Monday morning. And uh, they wanted to know how our portfolios did. So 13 trading days, the, um, the S&P 500 declined by 3%. The... Chicago quantum net score declined by 3.4% and the 60 sto 64 stocks, if you would have held them, declined by 2.8%. So in this case, there was a little bit more of a decline in the Chicago quantum net score. There's, I don't know that there's any extenuating circumstances. It's just um, the way it is. We're, we're still in research mode and we're trying to figure out how this, uh, how this behaves in the market. So now I'm going to talk you through some technical things. We still have a scale challenge. So imagine if we have, so we've run 1,855 stocks and we've built a cubo. We built a set of cubos, 1,855 times 1,855 times 1,855. What happens is at the larger number of stock level, the cubos become very, the values become very, very small. And so that's something we continue to think about. So far, we're getting the right answers, but I'm just worried that there won't be enough energy landscape for the quantum manila to find. The second is a positive. So D-Wave provides an inspector. And so you can see how you're, how you're embedding. There's three ways to embed. We've now added three ways to embed to our model. There's lazy fixed, there's embedding composite, and there's just fixed. So what happens is you can run something and make your own embedding and you can give it to D-Wave and it will use that every time. The second is you can do a lazy fixed embedding, which it goes through and finds one embedding and then it uses that however many times, a thousand times, a hundred times. 
The third is embedding composite, which is what this is from. So if you're telling D-Wave to give me 500 samples, it does 500 embeddings. And the reason it does that is sometimes the embedding could affect the likelihood of the right answer showing up, of the best answer showing up. So you have some, your, your solver variability seems to be in the quality of the embedding much more than it is the quality of the annealer. And so we've had to play with this. And in fact, the lazy fixed embedding where it found one and it ran it over and over again has tended to give better answers. D-Wave doesn't know why that is, but anecdotally we find that. And so you can always see the, the shape of your Cubo on the qubits right after you run it. I love that by the way, it's the coolest thing ever. So, because you can really see it, you can see the programming. The second is, what is a click? So the D-Wave, I mean, it can run 65, like Alex said, but I was told do 64 because there's almost always a couple of qubits that are broken. And so we do 64 clicks, fully embedded. This is what an embedding looks like. Stock zero or position zero, like stock zero, which is the first one is on this one and this one and this one and this one. And each of these is a qubit. By the way, you'll never see a number above 2048 because there's 2048 qubits. And so this is what this is. So you could type this in and you could say, I love this embedding, D-Wave use it. But we've chosen not to do that. But I'm guessing if a client were to give me $10,000 and said, give me the best portfolio, run this thing for a month, we would take the time to find the perfect embedding that gives them the best answers every time and use it in the fixed embedding composite. Engineering accomplishment. So this is real, I ran this like two days ago. So this is a simulated annealer. It runs on your machine, not on D-Wave. So it's a simulator. And what happens is the orange dots are what we wanted to give us. This was two stock portfolios all the way to 40. And the blue is what it actually gave. So this blue dot over here, excuse me, should have been way up here. And then the second time we ran it, you know, we changed a few things. It got worse. It curved away. The third time we ran it, it got even worse. The fourth time we killed it. We got the blue right in the orange. We got great answers. So now, of course, the next time we run this for that client, we're going to have the perfect simulated annealing embedding. And then we ran it backwards. So we ran the simulated annealer from 40 stocks to two stocks. This one was two stocks to 40 stocks. And actually, the answers weren't bad, but they were worse. So simulated annealers actually look at the, the order you run them it seemed to matter, but straight math, it, it really shouldn't matter. So we're starting to get like a feel for the solvers that's a little different than just, you know, pencil and paper. This next one, Monte Carlo, discrete probability N over two, like what we talked about with the taboo, that's that huge blue splotch in the middle. So most of those answers, this was 64 stocks, we're right between like the 20, looks like maybe it's 18 and 45, real dark. The CQNS scores in the middle, lower is better. In order to find your really great CQNS scores, it's two, three, four stocks. So the four stock solution in the Monte Carlo approach is your best one. Now this is a pretty cheap um, calculation. Maybe it takes four minutes, five minutes on a Macintosh. So you could run this first, get yourself thinking about it, and then decide, you know what, I'm going to focus in 25 stocks or less. I'm going to try to get this triangle right here of great values, and I'm going to focus on those. And that makes it very, very different. It makes it very clean. And so we have a choice if a client really wanted to go deep, deep, deep into just the 25 stocks. And imagine now I can do this on 1800 stocks. I could say, I'll look at 1855 stocks. I'll focus on 25, the best 25, because that's what trading costs and 
what a normal person might be able to handle in their portfolio. So that was interesting. We learned how to kind of see where the winners are. From a visualization perspective, we've learned how to, we have a ton of visualizations in the code now because anytime something hiccups, I wanna know where it is. Because there's, there's, a, there's a widow and an orphan back there that's got their money to invest, right? And so here, the sharp ratios, you can look for anomalies in the sharp ratios. The fact that there's really terrible ones is always interesting. But the Chicago quantum net score is interesting too because there's winners. I drew a little triangle. I said, there's the value right there and there's losers. If you just did Monte Carlo without like really probing into the small portfolios, you might never see these couple of solutions. And that's nice. That The quantum annealer gave us the intuition to then go back and dig a little deeper classically. And that's why we're doing the simulated bifurcator. We, we might find different answers, but we're gonna find them faster. And so imagine now, if I had something, a simulated bifurcator, where I could look at 1,855 stocks and I can look at it in three seconds, eight seconds, I don't mind. I don't mind doing it four or five times. For 50 bucks, I still don't mind. And then I get those answers and then I do the simulated annealer and I do a genetic algorithm and I do the Monte Carlo and I aggregate those into a numpy array and then I feed them back into the genetic algorithm. Now I've got the best that I could expect classically and it's efficient and it's fast before the market moved away from me. So maybe we've talked about maybe looking at a shorter term trading horizon. Maybe we could look at a day's worth of trades and we're doing the last half hour. That's cool because now we get the data 40 minutes before the close of the market. We crunch it for five or 10 minutes. We hand our client these recommendations and now they got 30 minutes to make money at the end of the market. We're not worried about some CEO. We're not worried about what happened last week or last month with COVID. We're worried about today's trading. When the guys at Goldman Sachs or UBS are sitting in their bullpen, they've been acting a certain way all day. How are they going to act in a minute? That's cool. That's why the simulated bifurcator is so important that we're adding it to our stable. So I just want to give you a little sense of the system we built, and I'm going to give you a little advertisement at the end. Uh, we do have 19 participants, so um, it's not a big advertisement. It's a tiny one. but So we offer the Chicago Quantum Net Score solution. If you give us up to 64 stocks, We'll run it quantum, we'll run it classical for 150 bucks. I ask for a day. It doesn't take a full day, but sometimes I'm not right by the email. Classical is $50. And so we do the, we do the full analysis. We run through positive beta, 253 trading days of data. We tune all the parameters. We do all the classical runs. We run the quantum annealer, and then we do a final genetic algorithm Think of it as we shake it one last time to make sure we had the best answer. We perform our analysis, we do the write-up. And so it works. And how it works, we download the data, we understand the market, we do the all-in, we do Monte Carlo, we run genetic algorithm all the way through D-Wave, we run genetic algorithm again, and then we show the results. And you think of it as voting by method. Because sometimes one solution might look a little better, they might have the same Chicago quantum net score, but they might have different stocks. So we're looking for, we give the client all of the votes of all the different models. Here's kind of what it looks like, um, 253 stocks. Here's the market. This was a couple of days ago, the market had returned 11%. The risk-free kind of, uh, the, the, the risky part of the market return was 11% over the past year. That number's been as high as almost 20. So we've seen a correction in the market. The all asset portfolio has a sharp ratio of 5.44 right now. We then run all the discretes and we run all the, um, you know, one stock, two stock, three stock, four stock, five stock, Monte Carlos, we get an answer. Then we did the genetic algorithm. In fact, it found the same exact answer. Then we did the genetic algorithm with the D-Wave seed. So we took it all the way through found the best answer. So what's interesting is this particular portfolio 
cons we consistently found the same stocks, the answer was clear. It was almost like the client handpicked them to make it easy, but they didn't because I know the client. Uh, this was for investors. And then we looked at the answers. In this case, it was ExxonMobil, um, uh, was this Leg Maison, and T. Rowe Price. So oil and smaller financial services firms. And then the D-Wave said, look, add O and add SYY. Taboo, of course, gave us 33 out of 64, right around the middle. And then all 64 is in there. You can see the difference. The Chicago quantum net score for all assets is three zeros and a two. The best is three zeros and seven, seven. So there's a lot of value created by finding the stocks with that move properly. Software overview, we run it on the D-Wave. By the way, you see 2,030 qubits were up two days ago. That's why you can't run 65, you gotta run 64. Because even one or two qubits is out, now I got a problem, right? We're running a 13 and a half millikelvin and it's, we're using Python 3.7. We use my Mac PC with the D-Wave. We FTP and validate the tickers out of NASDAQ. That's the source we're using is NASDAQ's ticker source. We tune all the parameters, right? We do, we've talked about this. We use the Canadian D-Wave hardware through their cloud service. Um, we get ones and zeros back, which we then have to translate back into the ticker names. And uh, again, coming soon, we're gonna take what Clark built, the simulated bifurcator, and we're gonna build that back into the production code. It's gonna take some testing, wanna make sure it works as we expected it. And these were some of the plots you saw and a few others. Sometimes people wanna talk about the plots. Um, and then I just wanna close. So, and then I'm gonna take questions after a few more quick, quick slides. The first is, where do you get the research artifacts? So you're gonna have these slides when we're done. Please don't share them with anyone. These are just for you. You'll be able to click on our 40 stocks, 60 stocks, and the Medium article. We like if you go to ResearchGate because that's where you can find everything in one place. The Medium articles and everything is all one click. We're in Google Scholar now, and our website shows a bunch of public citations. We've had articles written about us. It's, it's nice that the the industry was forgiving when we were just learning. 16 stocks, 24 stocks, everyone was nice to us. Now with 64 stocks, I gotta admit, a few companies aren't so nice to us because they're not running 64, they can't do it. They're coming to us to pay us to teach them how to do it. Right, right Alex? And, um, but other people, other companies are coming. And um, big, big people, big companies are coming to talk to us because we've butt up against the edge and they know that once Pegasus, once we have access to Pegasus and we can do, I don't know, 200 stocks, we're still not scaling more than what I could do on my Macintosh. But we're at a serious, 200 stocks, two to, the, two to the 200th is a serious number. Two to the 300 is a very serious number. And so that's great. What are our goals? The first goal is to mature and expand our portfolio optimization model and the application. Because it is for sale, because you can use it, we wanna add as much as we can to it and add features. It's like an MVP now. And uh, from the last call, we've had conversations about adding back testing to the model independent portfolio tiling, get, get the user experience better, that's great. Um, I'd rather scale first and get faster, get bigger and faster first. And then the other is we, we are open to serve clients. We'd like to because I've got three people that wanna get hired that are on the bench right now, but I don't have the revenue to hire them. I mean, there's, we wanna have 50 people getting a salary serving clients and that's important to us. Who are we today? You can see information about myself, about Clark and about Alex. These are the three main team members. And uh, how to find out about us. We are, we're military grade, by the way. So we can serve the military. We can serve any form of, the, of our federal government in the United States. We've got nice LinkedIn profiles and we're ready to go to work. 
for you. Vendor, I'm going to bring it back to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I think that was very splendid and very exciting. And more so, as I see now from the last time to this time, definitely tons of progress there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can see the huge difference there and the kind of, uh, it's not only portfolio management, you have uncovered the portfolio, you're ready to sell. Congratulations <laughs> once again. Thank you. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, we have had plentiful discussion. We have a few minutes still left and I still encourage, continue to have your discussion with Clark if you are comfortable on chat. But I have a couple of questions to put you in a bit of uh, future zone again, Jeff and Alex and Clark. And the first is very simple. I'm sure you must be working on some model to evaluate additional economic factors, some external externalities or something like stimulus is coming or not coming. Some prediction based models, how is that going to impact the market and this analysis of stock which we are doing and how is that going to impact the final recommendations as now I see in the portfolio you are providing some good artifacts, some good analysis, and there has to be some short-term and long-term association in that part of the recommendation. Of course, everything comes with a disclaimer in any market, any portfolio manager. The risk is mine, not yours. <laughs> so, so from that can, angle, that's my first question. Yeah, so I can start out like just briefly. Um, since we started, um, you know, on an initial turn, goal was to run this financial portfolio optimization on a quantum computer. And we actually were trying out the IBM Q initially. And obviously we realized that you're not gonna be able to do a real world problem on that. And it's theoretical right now. I mean, we can solve very small problems. So we moved to D-Wave. So our motivation was to go in that direction. And then we obviously then, I would say, evolved to using Cubos with different tools, you know, all the ones that we mentioned. As you can see, since we're kind of in the Cubo world, there's only so much you can put onto that matrix. You cannot bring in a lot of variables from the environment. Uh, I mean, you know, when you're trading in stocks, you have to know the fundamentals of the company. You have to know earnings, you have to know WAC, you have to know other things, yeah. right? None of that is being placed onto the Cubo. There's no room for those things on the Cubo. So, so that is, that is something important to keep in mind when you're dealing with this kind of uh, formulation. Can we bring in some of those fundamentals and create some special algorithm or objective function that uses or leverages those things? Maybe, we haven't really worked on that, but that would then, um, you know, that would, I would say you, you still have this bottleneck where you can only put so much on there. I would think we would have to go into machine learning and other kinds of formulations if we start thinking about predicting into the future or predicting based on, you know, um, the news or, you know, did, uh, did some sector go down? I mean, there's a lot of variables, but I think that's more machine learning. And that's why I think Clark should <laughs> answer, answer that from a machine learning kind of a perspective. Clark, please. Yeah, um, I, at, at present, I don't have any plans to start uh, predicting stuff in real time. Um, I think, so working in machine learning. And let me clarify and make the life super there in terms of predictions when I say, we know something is in the offing. We know that could take a shape X, zero or one, right? In terms of stimulus was a simple example I put because we know there are two factors, elections, stimulus, is that going to impact in a positive or a negative fashion where it could take your results into any direction? Those kind of things, not something like tomorrow morning there could be a hurricane and how can you predict that? Yeah, absolutely. So not, the expect, who wins? not the expectation. That's why I said, let me qualify my expectation there. That's fair. Yeah. Um, so there's this kind of sweet spot in calculating beta, right? If, if you want to take historical data, right? So I'm a basketball fan. Um, if you're trying to predict the NBA champions, and you take all the historical data, you're going to predict Lakers and Celtics all the way, all the time. And the Bulls are going to lose out in the semifinals, sadly. Every uh. year, that's going to be the prediction. But that's a bad prediction because it weights everything equally. So there's kind of a sweet spot in how far back can you actually take the data? 
maybe two seasons, one season, the last half season, you know. Um, in that sense, taking the average over a shorter period of time, but not too short, right, where you can really pick up some, some volatility and effects, the length of time for which the volatility is going to maintain close is fairly short. One week, two weeks, Jeff got yeah. it up to five weeks. I was, I was impressed that it stayed for five weeks. I was expecting it to go for three maximum. And so yeah. in this case, the predictions are that we can, we can run it end of day Friday every week and, and make a new portfolio for a one week out. And some weeks that will come up as the same portfolio, but if, if it's a buy and hold and you're willing to trade Monday morning, then yeah. the, the time series predictions don't become so important because you have enough data and it is really hard to make the, the volatility of a group of stocks move tremendously in one week. And, and exactly, but when I say that, I absolutely want to say here for audience and for everyone and myself, the basic discipline of stock market, we are not trying to dispense that. Things like exit strategy, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm not saying that you gave a stock recommendation that's going to run forever. Still, when you give as a recommendation to any of your clients, and if you are managing on their behalf as portfolio manager, or they are doing that management on their own, that discipline has to come. That is the basic inbuilt and basic premise for any stock portfolio. Absolutely. If, if we yeah. scale this up, we will yeah. bring in the, the neural networks, the, the LSTM, and I will, right. we'll, we'll have the quantum computer pick the stocks, and then right. we will back test and predict with machine learning just to check that uh, those predictions are going to hold for and it's going to have to be a fairly short amount of time. I mean, exactly. a neural network doesn't predict out more than a few days. So True. Um, I'll bring those in, but they will be like weekly predictions rather than, it'll be like close of week rather than exactly. close of I mean, predictions. That has a simple impact in terms of the next step, which we call as balancing your portfolio from time to time, whatever path you take, whatever discipline you follow, and then what periodicity you balance it at. And, and that could not be a game that I'm going to do it only on June 1. No, you cannot. Yeah. Right? Because things will change. Factors will change. Climate will change. Market will change. Economic factors will change. So the next question I have is, uh, again, uh, on the future, or if you're already incorporating something. I mean, we know, give for our audience and us some diverse portfolio examples. And what kind of problems from those diverse portfolios you think can be optimized or not be optimized using quantum or the classical? Give us a little bit more sense of that. If you, if you think you want to take shot on that. And I'm absolutely okay if you think this is something you want to come up in any of the future sequels, we would wait for that answer as well. Uh, I, I have one real quick thing to go is that um, stocks which trade or assets, equities which trade at different frequencies have a big problem in calculating a proper group uh, uh, volatility, right? If you, if you impute, say, something which only trades in months, month on month on month, right? You have uh, commodities contracts over a month, right? And that's the, if you if you just sort of straight line impute it, you have a very low volatility. I mean, you you're dividing by uh, square root thirty, right? Right. So it's going to look like a really low commodity, and that doesn't square with something which is traded on the uh, microsecond level, right? So mixing types of assets is uh, an extraordinary problem, and and we're looking into that. But how to consistently uh, pick this this volatility is a very difficult problem. So um, for now, the, the asset types have to be grouped on their own. And why I had the inspiration even to look at this problem was because quantum has much more arena to handle as compared to classicals. And I believe the times where we used to say that 30, 30, 30 or whatever stock mutual funds are completely bonds and cash that kind of preservation is no longer holding well in the market, especially if, as per our Fed's Powell 2023 or beyond, he's going to keep the rate steady until the next three years. So where is the value in those kind of uh, 
mix our portfolios overall. So, so that's the question I had the last question, I believe. Let, let me, me give let the me, uh, back. Jeff, you have the forum, please. No, no, I want to try to answer your question. Oh, thank you. I do. I've been thinking about it. So that was my aim to put you to it, that level. <laughs> you made me really think. I asked those guys to go first so I could really think about it. So you talk about factors, right? What factors could we build in? And I'm immediately thinking about financial engines. Mm -hmm. The company back, I don't, they're bought by someone else now, but they like factors. And then I started to think when you talked about, well, when you move forward, how might you uh, change things a bit? So the first thing is there are canaries in a coal mine. And so sometimes overnight, like there was a case when we were working on this code that the price of oil went negative. Remember that one night? Yes, absolutely. First time in the history it went negative. It, it ha so I was there. Mm -hmm. I tweeted. I, I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. <laughs> and I understood the issue because I'd seen the capacity of the storage tanks fill up. Correct but I couldn't tell you which stocks would go up and go down. Sure. I just knew that there was something very special happening. And I think ultimately, even though I'm really good at economics, I'm really terrible at knowing what the Goldman Sachs and the UBS guys are gonna do Monday morning when they get out of bed and they log on to their terminals. So I, I thought about First, I thought about those things, those big events. And then I thought, let's keep it simple. You could pre-select the stocks that go into your portfolio. Now we did negative beta out because it, there's a lot of history with why. Um, we took accounting irregularities out because I don't want someone that's gonna be delisted. But what else would I take out or put in? I mean, 1,855 stocks. Now our one client loves dividend aristocrats. So mm -hmm. there's people that say, all right, let me do that. There's other people that might say dividend yields, cash flow, cash flow metrics, growth rates, industry or sector plays, exposure to geographies. And then one that I shouldn't talk about, there's a currency thing, right? When, when there's a certain currency that moves really fast overnight, when okay. China's awake, <laughs> that has an effect on the market in the morning. And so I, I've even found and tweeted on when currencies have moved in a radical way for like an hour. What does that do to the market? And in the case I noticed, we had a massive fluctuation. It looked like Bitcoin and one or two foreign currencies just went haywire. Three hours later, they were calm again. And you watched it go crazy, and then you watched it bounce back. I was there when it went crazy. I don't trade by the second. I could have traded it all the way back. But, but I think as a team, we're not gonna take a position that says, when we find an anomaly in the currency market, we're gonna then go and short the banks. True. We're, we're just saying, go. know that it's there, run your correlations. This is like old fashioned stuff, but, but we're able to do, I mean, 1,855 stocks is like 10 to the 550th power search space. True. If I could do that for a client in an hour That's with validation, good. especially if I could do it at five in the morning. <laughs> That's a big win. <laughs> That's a big win. I got the whole last night. I'm in. Absolutely. He or she shows up with the full screen. And by the way, I'll give them all the quantum portfolios. I don't care. They could even look and see where the, where the deltas were, right? We picked one, but what were the best 30? And uh, so I think we're gonna stay away from factors, but, but any client, when they pick stocks to give us, can pre-select dividends, cash flow, earnings growth, again, geography, yeah. yeah and if they would have picked the right industries, they would have made a ton of money. And I think uh, with that, we could wrap up today's session as your model use. We, we talked about some use cases and examples in a layman language. 
what could be the different use cases where this same stuff can be ported to 30 seconds anyone can take the shot three of you i i mean if you're talking about just using a d wave or a cubo model yeah. um, i'm currently uh, actually using it for covid optimization so i'm actually using it to look at um, a, an energy function that uh, minimizes the um, the hospital beds with maximizing the GDP, you know, depending on whether you lock down the city or not. That will be actually presented at the D-Wave conference. Um, we have a presentation there also, and uh, the COVID will be presented with another team that I was working with. Um, I mean, there, I've seen a lot of different examples. I mean, I've seen um, a Markov network example using D-Wave where, um, you know, you can um, predict uh, what disease someone might have if you have only a little limited amount of information. Um, I mean, there's, yeah, so I mean, the Cubo will allow you to solve a lot of problems, but then it has limitations as well. Like yeah. I said, you can't put a lot of different kinds of variables into that one energy landscape. So um, it becomes a very different formulation and probably needs a different method to solve if you cannot put it into a Cubo. I, I use it daily for uh, feature selection for neural networks, making time series predictions. I, I want to give my neural network the best shot. So I, I, I use it as a dimension reducer. Thank you, Alex and Clark, for taking that last rapid fire. Thank you so much. That's been a splendid session once again. And we would look forward to have your emails as you wanted to share so that people could reach out to you. You can send that out so that when we post this, we can have the emails as well and people can then definitely leverage whatever your offers are. And with that, good luck for your next conference and good luck for your next use cases, Alex and Jeff and Clark. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Virendra. Thank Have you. a very nice evening, guys. Thank you very much. All right, Thanks, appreciate it. Our pleasure, yep. Thank you. Yeah, the recording will be posted on site. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Balaji. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, coming. Thank and, you. Uh... All right.